So it's, it's really a great pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Uh, we are, uh, I think, in for a really intense day of discussions and learning, and uh, I hope also making connections and new and old friendships. Uh, uh, we have a really packed agenda ahead of us, so I want to just use very few minutes uh, before we get into our keynote just to do two things. One is uh, a brief reflection, uh, but I'm, I'm going to do that second, uh, on, on, on you know, what we're trying to do. Uh, the first one is to thank, although we always try to finish and thank uh, a lot of the people who make this possible. I do want to do this at the beginning because sometimes we forget to do this uh, or we don't do it quite right. First of all, the Humanity Center, which is you know, graciously uh, hosting us today here in this beautiful house in the campus. Uh, Steve Kilele, uh, who has always been such a generous sponsor of all these uh, events and activities, the Stanley Foundation. Uh, I also want to thank the staff of IEP that has really, the Institute of Economics of Peace that has really been uh, we're working tirelessly to do this, uh, to make this happen. Our staff at Bolivar House, and in particular Elizabeth Saiz, who is our associate director, who is somewhere running around, I guess. Uh, and uh, our intern, uh, Catalina Ramirez Saez, who is one of our students that has been already two years in a row, we've been having this internship program uh, with the Institute of Economics of Peace and one of our students at Stanford uh, that uh, learns and joins with them and she has been also very important. And of course, Michelle Breslauer, who has tirelessly worked on making this all possible. Uh, now, the reflection is something about uh, Halloween. <laughs> So Halloween, if you think about it, is, is a festival uh, that, that has to do with a harvest festival. It is, it is you know, for me, the, the big association as Mexican is the Day of the Dead, the Dia de Muertos. Uh, but all of our cultures in different ways have these harvest, harvest festivals. And, and harvest festivals are important because they were, you know, traditionally, uh, humanity, all of us, uh, you know, all of our ancestors, were so much, you know, at the mercy of the forces of nature. Uh, we couldn't really know if a harvest was going to be good or bad. The rainy season would come in late, you know, or it would come in too strong, and then we would lose our harvest. So there was a lot of reason to celebrate uh, the sort of this this moment in in you know in this change of the seasons that we are in today. And and you can notice, I mean, Stanford, this this area, the whole season has changed this very week. Um, but. You know, to a large extent, humanity today uh, is mostly subject to risks that are not about nature anymore. Um, if you also look at, uh, you know, the kind of uh, one work I really admire on this is uh, the work by, by Steven Pinker, The Better Angel of Our Nature, a wonderful book that I recommend to everyone. Our societies are so much less violent than they had historically been. We're kind of at this incredible moment where we have really reduced violence to an incredible degree. And the other thing is that most of the risks and the uncertainties that people face are no longer because of earthquakes, hurricanes, uh, et cetera. No matter what has happened in the last few weeks, they are mostly man-made. You know, the, the toll, the death toll of an earthquake, the death toll of a natural disaster like a hurricane, uh, even a forest fire in Santa Rosa back here, those kinds of things depend so much on the kinds of things we as societies have done in the way we organize ourselves, we protect our own, and we make sure that those risks, those uncertainties do not catch us unprepared. I think that's one of the things we're really going to be talking about today, all day, about how we think about this preparedness and the way you know, our societies have been able to not be so subject to this kind of you know, forces of nature anymore. Uh, but we should not also be subject to these forces of mankind, which are still putting so many of us in, in peril. So welcome again, everyone. Uh, we, I hope we really have a very productive day today. And uh, I think uh, Michelle is going to do, oh no, or yeah, Ayla is going to do the introduction for the Stanley Foundation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm Jaya LaQuest. I'm the program officer for our Mass Violence and Atrocities program at the Stanley Foundation. Um, Alberto, you did a wonderful job thanking everyone, so let me just say yes, um, thank you all for everyone who partnered on this event. We're really excited to be a part of it um, and to be here at the conference um, as participants and co-organizers um, in both forms. So um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Stanley Foundation and the program that I work on um, and then why we've partnered with the Institute for Economics and Peace and the Center for 
Latin American Studies and, and the Humanities Center here at S Stanford, um, and then we can get on with our morning. Um, so the Stanley Foundation seeks a secure peace with freedom and justice built on global, global citizenship and effective global governance. We work to advance multilateral action to create fair, just, and lasting solutions to critical issues of peace and security. We recognize the essential roles of both the policy community and civil society in building sustainable peace. You may be surprised to find out that the foundation is based in Muscatine, Iowa, on the banks of the Mississippi River, and we value our Midwest location and the perspective it brings to our work. So as I mentioned, I am the program officer on our Mass Violence and Atrocities team, where we specifically work towards enabling diverse stakeholders at all levels to create durable and inclusive institutions and mechanisms that strengthen societal resilience to mass violence and atrocities. So we do this in a few different ways. We help establish prevention-focused regional networks. We engage different policy sectors to work effectively together to develop and promote a resilience agenda. And we promote, promote evidence of what works in building resilience at the regional, national, and local levels in global reform processes. To accomplish these goals, we draw on our strengths as a convener of key stakeholders, including international and regional organizations, national governments, civil society, and the private sector. And we also commission expert policy analysis and actively engage the media on our policy issues. Advocacy is a core part of our programming, where we help build support for spe specific outcomes that we expect to advance in our vision and mission. This is why we've partnered with the Institute for Economics and Peace on this year's Positive Peace Conference, focused on research, policy, and practice. The foundation has been working on strengthening resilience to mass violence and atrocities in Latin America with government and civil society actors for many years now. We just marked the fifth anniversary of the Latin America Network for Genocide and Mass Atrocity Prevention in New York two weeks ago. And we recently convened a group of experts from civil, so civil society to discuss the ongoing crisis in Venezuela and its regional implications. I'm happy to have some of our partners in this work joining us in the room today to share how this work connects to positive peace and resilience. The 2017 Positive Peace Report says, positive peace builds the capacity for resilience and the possibility and incentives for nonviolent alternatives to conflict resolution. It provides an empirical framework to measure an otherwise amorphous concept, resilience. Just two weeks ago, we held a conference asking, what works to reduce and prevent violent conflict? I love that Positive Peace helps answer this question by providing a framework for action to policymakers and stakeholders at all levels, from the community to the multilateral. And I expect that investing in efforts to achieve greater levels of Positive Peace will help us advance the mission and vision of the Stanley Foundation. I look forward to meeting all of you throughout the day, um, and I hope you enjoy the conference. I also have a couple of housekeeping small um, tidbits for you. There's um, a Wi-Fi Stanford visitor, I think it is, um, and you do not need a password, so you can just log in and accept um, some terms and conditions. And also, um, we're a little bit behind on time, um, and we were already tight to begin with, so if you're um, asked to speak quickly or finish remarks um, within a certain amount of time. It's not personal. Um, we're just excited and want to give everyone an opportunity to share. So thank you all. Um, and Michelle? Wonderful. Thanks, everybody, for coming. You've probably emailed with me or with Caitlin or Jai already around this conference. Um, so I'll keep my remarks brief because you'll hear shortly from my colleagues at the Institute for Economics and Peace. We're thrilled to host the second conference around positive peace at Stanford University again. We worked with Alberto in 2015 to hold the inaugural conference here at Stanford. And for us, it's a great entree into a new group of people, a new network here on the West Coast. I'm here on behalf of the Institute for Economics and Peace, which if you don't know is a not-for-profit independent think tank. We have offices in Sydney, Australia, in New York, in Mexico City, in Brussels, and in The Hague. And while we're working to try to bring a quantitative, data-driven approach to peace, I think one of our most unique added values to this space is around the positive peace framework, around identifying what drives peaceful societies, and then trying to measure that. 
and take the tone of that in countries and around the world. And that's what we're here to discuss today. We know that violence is complex. We know that resilience is complex. So it takes more than just one actor or one stakeholder to think about how we approach these issues. We do need a whole of society approach and that's why we've asked people from a variety of different sectors, private sector, humanitarian assistance, peace building organizations, advocacy and policy to talk about positive peace from the lens of policy, from the lens of research and from the lens of practice. So I hope you have a fruitful discussion. I will be your MC to help you through the day. And I'd just like to thank the Center for Latin American Studies, the Stanley Foundation, and Stanford Humanities for organizing and co-hosting. And now can I ask Steve Killalay, the Executive Chairman and Founder of the Institute for Economics and Peace, to join us up here at the podium for his keynote. 